Okay, Chaste Hashem. Is everybody ready? Okay. We are in the third part of a three-part series. Uh, we did it in the wrong, in the reverse order. It was supposed to be uh, first Shiduchim, and then moving a stage forward to Shalom Bayis, and then moving another stage forward onto Chinuch uh, Yeladim. But Venahafochu, just like everything in the world is upside down at these times, we did it the other way around, and we're going to start with Shaduch. We're going to end with Shaduchim. So we're going to tell a story. Our story is going to be about Yitzchak. We're going to accompany Yitzchak on his journey through Shaduchim. And along each station along the way that Yitzchak takes, there's going to be a lot of lessons that we can learn from his experience. And you know, like my grandfather told me, you, you don't have to make the same mistakes that everybody else makes. You can learn from other people's mistakes. You don't have to make all the mistakes. So we're going to learn from Yitzchak all the different mistakes that he made along the way. And then Be'ezrat Hashem Barach will be able to not have to make those mistakes ourselves. So Yitzchak um, is lonely. His friends have started getting married already. And he has this social pressure, this peer pressure of thinking, I don't know if he's looking inside himself, but he's looking around at everybody else. And he's seeing everybody else is getting ready. And then obviously if they're getting ready, if they're getting married, that must mean I'm ready as well to get married. And he has this insecurity that maybe, uh, maybe he's not able to get married and that no one loves him. And therefore, he decides that it's best that he gets married right now so that he can solve all those emotional issues that he has by getting married and then having emotional stability. So he starts dating. And the first girl that he meets is very, very special. He's very fortunate. HaKadosh Baruch Hu sent him Gan Eden on the first time. So he starts getting these uh, anxiety attacks. What if I'm not good enough for her? What if she doesn't like me? And what if she's upset with me? And what if, um, and what if uh, afterwards she reveals that I'm not who... She thinks I really am. And the truth is that she was very easygoing and very happy to continue with him, but he was plaguing himself so much with doubts. Will she solve my loneliness? Will she fix my character traits that I haven't been able to fix myself? Will she encourage me to go and learn when I'm not encouraging myself to go and learn enough? And he's all, all insecure about himself that uh, she gets fed up of him. And she says to him, uh, listen, uh, you may say that you're ready to get married and you may be going on Shaduchim, but I don't think you're ready to get married. You first have to you make sure that you're at a level of emotional maturity that you actually are ready to get married. Um, and then Yitzhak learns rule number one. You first have to fix yourself before you go and try and uh, bond with someone else. If you don't have a healthy sense of self, then yourself won't be able to connect to another. Similar also to our relationship with HaKadosh Baruch Hu, just in parentheses, uh, if you wish to have a deep relationship with the Kaddish Baruch Hu, then the criteria for that is you have to have a deep recognition of who you are, what your traits are, what your growth pattern is, and then you have a sense of self. And that sense of self can no, then go and connect to Hashem. Now, I'm going to say a little word now, which will help us in the section that we're in now, but also it's very useful if you ever find yourself in a Sheva Baruch Hu, and they look to you and they say to you, well, you're obviously not married, so you have great advice to say about Sheva Baruch Hu. What do you have to share with us? Young Yeshiva Bocho. So you're going to say this little vote, which I heard at my wife's cousin's Sheva Brochos, and it's very much along this line. There are seven Sheva Brochos that we make. Well, the first is Agafim, but then there's another six. And two of them end in a very, very similar way. The one ends, Mesameh Chatan Vekala, and the last one ends, Mesameh Chatan Im Hakala, which sounds like a very similar thing. And the Gemara and Ksuvas makes a deal, and we're going to not take the exact same deal, but a, a similar theme. What is the difference between Mesameh Chatan Vekala and then afterwards Mesameh Chatan Im Hakala? There's two different stages. There's a stage where they're not yet Im, they're not yet together, and there has to be a sense of joy that HaKadosh Baruch Hu has with each of them. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is Sameach with the Chatan, and HaKadosh Baruch Hu is Sameach with the Kala. Once you first have that stage, that each one of themselves has built themselves, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu Kivyachol is happy with them, then once Hashem is Sameach with the Chatan and separately with the Kala, then you can reach the next stage of Mesameh Chatan Im Hakala. Then they're able to connect with one another. There first has to be a sense of emotional maturity before you move on to trying to connect with someone else. Otherwise, whatever issue you have, you're just going to bring into that marriage and it's going to create friction between you. Not because there's any issues between you, because there's issues that you have that you haven't yet resolved. So uh, there's an excellent book by uh, a, a woman who writes in Mishpacha magazine every week. Her name is Sarah Hannah Radcliffe. And she has there a marriage readiness test that you can take. I wanted to just uh, list, and if you're writing down, I recommend writing down 
these nine points that she makes of how to judge yourself if you are ready for marriage along the emotional, mature, not just emotional, but other areas as well. And the rule that she says is, if you would give yourself above a seven out of 10 in all of these areas, then you're pretty ready to get married. If there's any of these areas that you find yourself giving below a five, then you're, you're not ready to get married until working on that area. And you can uh, use your intuition to work on uh, where exactly you need to be holding all of these areas. So these are the nine areas. We spoke yesterday in Pirkei Avos about areas of life balance. It's a similar concept, but we're getting a lot more detailed. So point number one that she makes is, can you handle responsibility? When you make a commitment, do you fill that commitment? If you find yourself at least seven out of 10 filling uh, in commitments that you've made, you're able, someone gives you responsibility, you see it through, that's a good sign. That's number one. Number two is managing money. Are you able, are you responsible with your money? Are you able to budget your money? Are you able to set aside money for savings to give stock? Um, are you responsible when it comes to money? Point number three is how do you handle anger? It's not saying you, should you can never be angry, but you do have to have a way that you're able to deal with your anger. Are you sensitive when there's someone uh, angers you? Are you able to calm yourself down before responding? Are you able to then express it in a healthy way and say uh, break from that tension moment, then afterwards come back and share with them what's going on? So number three was managing anger. Number four is the ability to give. And this could be in many areas. Are you able to give compliments? Are you able to show emotional support? Are you able to give of your time? Are you a giving orientated person? Number five, the ability to speak in a pleasant way, have good communication skills, speak nicely, relate in a positive, healthy way. Number six, which is different to number three, is managing your own stress, not anger, but stress. When you have mood, when you, have, when, you have, when you feel out of balance, when you feel depressed, are you able to get yourself into balance? Are you able to handle your own emotions and able to like take the next step and move on from any things that you feel were causing you tension and stress? Point number seven, and do not deride this one, is being neat. Um, anyone who has a roommate in Karen Biavana who has spoken to me about this topic in the past, you will testify to the fact that it is important that your spouse or your roommate or your uh, partner has cleanliness, has neatness, has tidiness. It can be a cause of great friction. So of course, we're not talking about like being pedantic about it, but certainly that it's in a normal check. Point number eight is health and hygiene, that you're taking responsibility in those areas. And point number nine is that you're able to share and negotiate when you have debates, when you have friction, when you have conflict, are you able to handle those areas? So that's not so posh. And when Yitzchak read in that book, let me tell you what that book is called. Make Yourself at Home. That's the name of the book by Sarah Shana Radcliffe. And it's an appendix at the end. So when he read that list of nine areas of life balance, he found that in more than one area, he gave himself below a seven. And he realized he needs more time to think those ideas through, speak to friends about it, find practical ways of building himself and get more of like a clear direction of who he is, who he wants to marry. And then a kind of idea of, well, he should be on the same level of what he's expecting of her. He should be in a similar place. If he's expecting her to have all these wonderful, beautiful traits, then maybe he should offer her the same or at least close. So he does a process. It takes him a few months, actually, to get through these ideas. To, again, he's not perfect, but he's not expecting to marry someone perfect either. But he does get to a place after a few months of work where he feels comfortable with who he is. He moves away from the idea of a perfect woman in the media and society. And he gets to more of a grounded idea of who he wants to marry. And Baruch Hashem, he's ready for his second date, his second shidduch. Okay? He's read a lot of Musar. He's spoken to a lot of people. He's ready for number two. All goes well at the beginning. He likes her. She likes him. They go out one date, another date, a third date, a fourth date. And uh, it's fine. Uh, he can't complain. She can't complain. They get along and they're speaking very, like they're enjoying each other's company, but they're waiting for the big moment. Where's the big moment? Right? They're sure that at some point there's going to be fireworks. They're waiting for those fireworks. They're waiting for that spark. They're waiting for that feeling of, this is your big day. Like every time in the movies where he sees her and she sees him, there's always something in the background, which, or some music that gives you this sense and this feeling like, this is the one, this is the one you've been waiting for. And, and he convinces her that you need that. She wasn't sure that you needed that. But after saying to her, I don't know, like I'm not feeling anything amazing. Are you feeling something amazing? And so she says, um, I'm happy, but I don't know if it's amazing. She says, oh, yes, yeah, so you're in the same place as me. So then 
he forces her basically to feel that it's a mutual agreement that they uh, they're obviously not cut out for each other. There's nothing wrong, and it's fine. They're enjoying each other's company, but it, it's obviously not that. Let, let me be straight with you. It, Hashem decided that it's obviously not meant to be. It's Mishraman. If that's what Hashem wants, look, I don't want to interfere with Hakadosh Baruch Hu's ways. If this is Hashem's ways, that's what He wants, then who are we to argue? And they come to a mutual agreement that it's obviously not Mishamayim, it's not the Zivug that was always destined. And they friendly, mutually agree to break it up. And uh, he's a little disappointed afterwards, and he's thinking to himself, let me go speak to my rabbi to get some chizuk. So he goes to his rabbi, and his rabbi says to him, why didn't you come to me earlier? We could have saved a great shiduch. That is not how we judge the value of a shidduch. Now, this is a very important point his rabbi shares with him. He says, listen to me very carefully. How do you know? And this is always the question. How do you know? How do you know? What are you supposed to be looking for? What are you supposed to be judging it based on? So his rabbi says, let's, let's be a little grounded here and think carefully. There are two elements that you need. And these both emanate from the Gemara. One element is you have to use your seichel. The Gemara says in Baba Basra, that when you're looking to have a shidduch, you should look at who her brother was. Now, what is the logic behind looking at who her brother was? I'm not marrying her brother. I'm marrying her. But when you see who her brother was, you get an understanding of the type of home she grew up in, how her parents raised their children, likely that she's going to follow in a similar vein. Now, I must be honest with you and be very straightforward with you, that Rav Steinman, Allah Shalom, he said that in our era, in our days, it is not a fair judgment to judge how other members of her family turned out. And therefore, what the Gemara says is less applicable in our days. But Steinman says it used to be when a person's primary main influence in growing up in their home was their parents, then it was a very good judgment call to see how your wife is going to raise her sons, your sons, based on how her mother raised her, the, her brother going to be a similar pattern. But nowadays, when the influence comes from very, very far-fetched sources, and it's not only the immediate family that is raising, so it is an unfair statement for a person to judge this girl based on her brothers. And therefore, even if you have someone who has a sibling who is not on the path of Torah, that is no longer a factor that one should take into account because this person creates their own path. And this is something which I just want to say personally before we get to back what the rabbi was saying to Yitzchak that I've had this discussion many times with people, people who are going out on Shiduchim, they often ask me, but what about this point that I heard from the past or her family or something which is not so... I said, is that something that you see that is affecting you in your relationship with her now? Do you see that fact that her parents were divorced? Do you see the fact that she has a child who went off the derech, a, a sibling who went off the derech? Do you see that as, as a, a, affecting your relationship together? Do you see like some flaw in her in the way you relate to her and he says no like she's amazing like she's built herself so much from having gone through that she's an amazing person today so, said, so it's not an issue meaning you don't have to make up issues of some on on the on the list it says some fault there you know sometimes when you get a file from a medical file if there's something which is a problem it comes up in a big red her parents were divorced big red oh no but you've met her you've related to her she's a greater person as a result you don't have to worry about things that are on paper if when you relate you're not marrying her resume you're marrying her and if you've related to her and it's a good relationship you don't have to worry about if there's something written there which you then want to discuss with her to see how she deals with it and how it's affected her, that's a very healthy thing to do. You don't have to ignore it. You can bring it up and see how resp her response that is. You know, not in the first date, but after a couple of dates. But you don't have to worry about and rule something out because it's written on paper. So back to Yitzchak. So Yitzchak's Rav wants to give him guidance. And he says to him, listen to me clearly. When you go on a shiduch, when you go on a date with a girl, all you're looking for is that you feel comfortable and that you're looking for the next, you're looking forward to the next date. You feel you, could, you can relate to her as a friend. And you, uh, after a, that's, the, on the, that's the first couple of times. And then after a few times, when you've already got more of an understanding of her direction, her goals and aspirations, then you feel that you're on the same page in a very broad sense. You feel as someone who you could take the next step with. You see you could live with her long term. You don't have to be very pedantic. You don't have to give her a survey to question, to answer, to see if she fulfills all your criteria. In fact, the longer your list is, 
and the less likely you're ever going to find anybody. Drop the list. You know how crazy lists are, the rabbi says to him. Like, what do you write on a list? You write sense of humor. Okay, well, this guy has a sense of humor. Good, perfect shidduch. Then you meet her, and her jokes are terrible. It, it would be better if she didn't have a sense of humor. It cracks your spine when she tries to make jokes, because what your definition of sense of humor is, and what her definition of humor are very, very different. You cannot judge a person by what's written on paper. Your lists are pretty irrelevant. Leave the list at home. Meet the person. If you feel comfortable with them and you feel you're on the same page, hashkafically, broadly, then you can take the next step forward. We're going to discuss as we go on how to make the final decision. But it's interesting. I don't have a very, very clear answer to this. And I'll be happy if someone could give me one. But we have two prototypes in the Torah, in Sefer Bereshis, about Shiduchim. We have the love at first sight of Yaakov and Rachel. And we have the Yitzchak and Rivka, where she first came into his tent, and then he loved her. So I agree there are two different ideas there. And I'm not saying this about Yaakov and Rachel, but in general, things that come quickly, leave quickly as well. That's not true in the context of Yaakov. But if you base your decision on her, on some like flash, on some inspiration, on some spark, on some then that's something which came very quickly. It's also going to leave very quickly. But if you base it on, you got to know her, you gave to her. The more you invested in her, like Rabbi Desla says, giving causes loving, the more you invest in her, you come to love her more and more. That the Yitzchak model is a more healthy model for us to base how to know to a relationship on. You invest in her, you come to love her more and more, and it's a great ship. The rabbi then says to Yitzchak, you know why people feel a flash, those who feel it? You know why they feel it? It, it's something psychological. It's nothing deep and real. Except, for, I'm not talking about Yaakov. Yaakov Avinu, the, the sources of Kabbalah say that he saw that his root neshama was the hashlama of her root neshama. We're, let's be humble here and say we're not on that level of Kabbalah to feel that. So on a psychological level, all it is, is that when you meet people, you get a subtle impression of whether you like them or don't like them. And then every person that you meet after that, then they remind you of people you met in the past. And if this person has traits or looks that strike a chord of someone that you've met in the past, even if you're not making that connection consciously, but it reminds you of someone you knew at some point and you are fond of that person, then boom, suddenly you have this feeling of, I like this person because it reminded you, it gave you recall, that's the term, it gave you recall, at what's actually called subconscious recall, of someone who you knew in the past and you felt like connected to them there's another theory that goes like this, that you have issues with your parents. And when you meet someone who you feel that could be a ticket for how you can relate to your parents, then, uh, then you have this like very strong urge to connect to them, to fix. So the rabbi says, it may be this, it may be that, but you know what happens? One fight and all that glamour disappears. One point of contention, one point of friction, all those stars vanish. And therefore it's very, very unhealthy to base your marriage on having a flash of inspiration. Why does HaKadosh Baruch Hu give the constant flash inspiration? Because marriage is a pretty hard commitment and sometimes people aren't able to make that commitment so easily. He wants to help them get over that and therefore he gives them this push where they're able to say like, okay, I'm, I'm in, I see it's great. And then you're able to then feel connected. But the goal then is then you build in an authentic way. That was lesson number two that Yitzhak learned. You missed out on another potential shidduch, but okay, Baruch Hashem, shidduchim are about learning. You learn a lot about yourself. You learn about other human nature. It's a healthy process, and he takes it in his stride. Okay, shidduch number three, it doesn't take Yitzhak long at all to discover if it's right or not. They go out after a, a Shadchanit's recommendation, and uh, pretty much straight away, they discover that they're not compatible on a surface level because he is not willing to leave Israel. He's decided that he's making aliyah. He's already keeping one day. He's determined to have a kolo lifestyle. She's here on holiday. She wants an American lifestyle of numerous cars, numerous uh, rooms, numerous fronts of the house where you can have that side of the front of the house and that side of the front of the house. She has ideas of how many shaitals she wants and where she wants to go away in different far-fetched European and other locations for every shlosha uh, regale, aliyah, regal kind of. And, uh, sh and, and it's very, very different pages. He wants a simple Pashtus color lifestyle and no way he's leaving Israel. She has different ideals. Now, that could easily have been resolved in checking out thoroughly before meeting. You don't have to have gone through the process of heartache. And therefore, point number two that Yitzhak also learns the hard way 
is do your research. There are sometimes Shadchanim who do research very well. There are some who just feel bad for the girl. She hasn't had Shaduchim offered for a very long time. So here's a new boy on the scene. He hasn't heard about her. Let's set them up. Who knows? Maybe something will come from it. Worst case scenario, they won't. Best case scenario, I'll get $1,000. It's a good opportunity. So therefore, he, she offers the Shaduch without doing all that back research. Very unhealthy. And therefore, rule number three is, do all your back and research. Make sure that the things that are red lines for you, the things that you know ahead of time, are your, there's no way you're willing to mavater on those. Even obviously, meaning that, that, that who you are, that the essence of who you are, check those out beforehand. And there's a bit of a problem here, and I'm a bit embarrassed to say this, but this girl happened to be very attractive. And when Yitzhak met her for that first time, and then he found himself drawn to her. And the more he spoke to her, then he said, you know, who says one has to live in Eretz Yisrael? Didn't Rav Moshe Feinstein live in Chutz Aretz and he wrote some tshuva about it? It is a mitzvah, but it's not a mitzvah chiyuvis, it's a mitzvah kiyumis. So it's not really a problem to go to Chutz Aretz. And the Lubavitch Rebbe, he was a big rabbi, he never came. And the Chofetz Chaim, they say he wanted to come, but in the end he didn't. And the Gra, they say he wanted to come, but he also didn't. So, and Eretz Yisrael is important, but doesn't it say in the Gemara that you're allowed to leave Eretz Yisrael for a shidduch? So this girl, I think she's my besheret. Like I think that, and kola lifestyle, it is important, but doesn't it say somewhere, tova, derech eretz in Torah, you have to like earn a lit, and im ein kemach ein Torah, and im ein Torah and ein kemach. And doesn't it say that about Rabbi Shmuel, that, that, that most people aren't able to do Rabbi Shimon by Bar- Yochai's derech, and like one in a thousand can manage that, but the majority of people, the nation work for a living, and she's, I think, I think we're cut out for each other. You know, I think that she's meant to be. So she looks at him and she says to him, if you're willing to give up your fundamental values, that means you're a nobody. And I don't want to marry a nobody. So that ends that very quickly. But be very careful. Sometimes the attraction is so strong and so powerful that you lose yourself and you lose your values and you seem to give up on things that are very crucial. Just by the way, all the advice that I'm giving based on this story emanates from real stories with Bochrim or friends that I've had who have gone through this process. These are not far-fetched, made-up things. This is a very real reality that takes place. So he's, after that, that she dumps him, he's very confused about the idea of looks. Like, uh, is it an important thing? Is it not an important thing? Like, look what an important factor there it was. Only when he's out of her spell, suddenly he like, catches himself and he says, what was happening to me there? How do I relate to this? Someone tells him, he's that same Rebbe from before. He goes to that Rebbe again. He says, Baruch Hashem, it's important to have a Rebbe that you can go to with these questions and feel comfortable to discuss this question with the Rebbe. Sometimes the person feels embarrassed. Well, I'm going to track, I'm going to discuss with the Rebbe how attractive a girl is to me. I don't know if that's appropriate. It's very appropriate. You can make a very bad decision without having to clarify these ideas. So the Rebbe that he goes to, Baruch Hashem, he has a Rebbe. And if you don't have a Rebbe, you make a Rebbe. A sell a you create one. You find him, you speak to him, you explain yourself, he, he accepts it, and it all goes well. Says to him that the Chazon Ish made a diok in the Gomorrah Kedushin. The Gomorrah Kedushin says that you have to see the woman before you marry her. As the Pasuk says, And why do you have to see her? Shema Yir Mugune. Now, let's be Madaik. If you'll see something off-putting and you'll be offended, meaning, that's the wrong word, offended, but you'll be off-put, you'll feel aversion, then the issue there is that you won't feel that you can love her. And you'll transgress via haftal reach kamocha. So if we're getting a clear definition here, you don't have to look for someone who you feel drawn to, lustful towards, you feel attracted to and you feel you can't take your eyes off her it's actually an issue to look at her beyond that first moment of deciding is she good enough you have to look for someone who you feel comfortable with comfortable with not someone you feel an aversion to the more you invest in the discussions the more you invest in the relationship and you give to her more and more then the natural not off-putting feel comfortable will build and build and build, and she'll be very attractive in your eyes, long term. However, if it's someone who, when you look at them initially, you feel off-put by them, it's going to be difficult, even in you, if you invest in them, that there could always be a sense of, okay, I love her, but I'm not going to look at her. That's not going to be healthy for Shana Bias. 
And therefore, it's not appropriate that a person makes a tznai that she feels overly attractive. A person shouldn't marry someone and be mavater on, I don't care that she doesn't look, I, I'm marrying her, l'shem shamayim. No, no. Rather, follow the Gemara's advice. Look at her that one time that you're allowed to see that you don't feel off-put, but you, you feel comfortable. You don't have to be drawn and attracted to, but you feel comfortable. And then you can fulfill the mitzvah of the Hafter and continue to invest in the relationship. And that was an important lesson for him to learn. Now, I want to add one clause to that. There are some people, and there is no room for judgment here. No one, no one is judging their spiritual level. But there are some people who, without, they didn't choose this, but they just find this, that the point of attraction for them is a very high level. It's very, very important for them. And they understand the principle of the Chazon Ish, this deal. They understand the principle, but they just find themselves being off-put by things that other people tell them that's not off-putting. Now, other people say, that's attractive, that's fine, there's nothing wrong there. And they say, I know, but I just feel I can't. And a person has to be real with himself. If a person can lower that and he can say, like, don't get so caught up on it and he can speak himself out of it and he can relate to her and look at her and, and feel that he could develop a relationship, it's a healthy thing to do. But he has to be real with himself. And if he says, I don't know why I have this very, very strong need and my level is very high, I don't know why that's the case, but I just feel I won't be able to look at her even though other people say that she's attractive. I won't be able to, a person to take that seriously. If it happens that, that because of that, Years are passing and he's not finding a shidduch. Then he should probably speak to someone and try and work with it. Speak to some professional, speak it through. Maybe he can get over that in some way. Uh, but initially, one should take that point seriously. If it's getting too far in a, a year or two years of chas are passing and that's the only point holding him back, he should speak to someone. But he should respect that point. Okay. Yitzchok is determined. He's going to make it work. Time number four, he's going to go out now. And he knows what it takes. He feels emotionally mature. He's done that work already. He's not looking for some magical spark. He does all the background research to see, find her on the right page. And he meets girl number four. And all begins well. And they're talking and they feel comfortable with each other. Baruch Hashem. But she's very, 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 very different from him. Whenever he starts a sentence, he says, I think, and then he continues. And whenever she starts a sentence, she says, I feel, and she continues that way. And he's always thinking and she's always feeling. And it feels like they're on different planets. It feels like they're not talking on the same language. And, and he, in, never in his mind, in his life, would he dream of just approaching someone on the street and engaging them in conversation. And, and she's just standing there at the bus stop while they wait to get someone. And just, she just goes up to this other woman. She says, that's such a pretty uh, mitpachat. Where did you get it from? Where did you buy it? And he's like, why are you talking to a random woman you don't know in the street? And he feels a little awkward about that. And she talks and talks and talks and talks. And then she complains. Why don't you talk? And he doesn't understand what she has so much to talk about. And he's, 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 he's unsure about this whole matter. On the one hand, to be honest, it's quite interesting, meaning it's, it's a whole new perspective of life. And, and to be very honest, she, she has a sensitivity to emotions that he doesn't have. She can pick up on things that he himself is not sensitive to. But on the other hand, they're very different, so different. And that whole question of opposites attract or you should marry someone the same as you. And he's just like not sure where to find himself on this page. So... He's thinking of calling it off. But he remembered what happened that one time when uh, he called it off without taking advice from his Rebbe. So he goes back to his Rebbe and his Rebbe says to him the following, you know, there's no rule. There's no rule. You have some shiduchim, some marriages which work very well. When you look at the husband, you look at the wife and you say, who even thought to set them up? <laughs> what were they thinking? They are so different. But then you look at them and they get on really well. And there's a, a harmony there where, okay, they, they bring out different strengths. Right? They're very different aspects they each bring out. But, but on the other hand, it's it, like it works. It just works very well together. And then you look at another couple who are like exactly the same and they have so much common advice, so much to talk about. Now that seems like it could go well either way, but it could be that each of those examples could be terrible. You can have two people opposites, and because they're opposites, there's friction, and there's complaints, and there's frustration, and, 
And on the other hand, you can have two people the same and it's boring. And it's really boring. Like they all, they just think the same way the whole time. They, 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 there's no color. There's no light. It's very boring. And their children don't develop a healthy, well-rounded uh, personality because there's only one way. This is the way. And then they, they become quite rigid in their way of thinking. And it's also unhealthy. So he realizes that it's not about looking for someone the same or looking for someone opposite. That. That's not a factor. It's just not a factor. The question is for you, how does it relate to you? It could be that you're very similar and that actually will be healthy and helpful in many ways because you'll have a deeper understanding of each other, the background, you won't have conflict. I'll give a very small example, but if, if, you, if a boy from England marries a girl from America or vice versa, or if a boy who's Sephardi marries a girl who's Sephardi or vice versa, there are subtleties which they may not easily be able to pick up on. But in his language, when he says a certain phrase, it, it means something and she doesn't pick up on that and that causes tension or things which to him are obvious that you have to behave in a certain way or speak in a certain way. She doesn't have a appreciation or sensitivity for. And it's much easier if you're both from the same background, have the same understanding. There's a boy who I'm close to this day is not married because he only wants to marry someone who's not only in his general same background, but also in his very specific same background because he's so caught up on this concept of, I don't want there to be friction, that he's only willing to marry from a very, very small pool of girls. Is that right or wrong? Well, there's logic to it. It makes a lot of sense. It, it, will, it will overcome a lot of background and society and culture. But Lavdafka, it could be that you'll meet someone and if you blend well together and you have harmony between you, it could make a very well-rounded, healthy relationship. So you have to do some deep thinking, Yitzhak, and you have to ask yourself, the fact that you're different, is that something which you admire in her and you respect in her and you can see that it would blend well together? Or is it something that really irritates you? And the more you meet, the more it frustrates you. And it, like, each time you, you know how she's going to say and you just don't want to hear that again and it's going to cause more tension. So he thinks it through. And, you know, Shaduchim is not just a simple, like, math problem. You have to know yourself and understand yourself very well and take advice from other people. And he realizes that for him, it's irritating. For him, it annoys him. It's not just a question of like, oh, that's so nice to have a wife who's bubbly and that's going to bring out so much more enrichment and joy in my family. For him, it's, it really annoys him. And he doesn't think that's going to get better with time. He can see it's getting more and more frustrating. And that's a very important thing to know, red lines. Let's just talk about red lines for a minute. This is what the Rebbe guides him. There are two types of red lines that you have to clarify for yourself. There are the objective red lines and there are the subjective red lines. The objective red lines are abuse, whether that be physical abuse or verbal abuse. And another objective red line is highly critical, uh, putting down of the character that you feel yourself, you don't like yourself when you're around them. And uh, along a similar vein is that although you do have moments where you really enjoy and you have highs of moments of being together, but the overall, there's more tension and friction. Like the overall is, is unhealthy. Those are objective signs that it's not appropriate. There are some subjective signs that it's not appropriate that you have your own personal relations. I want to give a couple of examples from Bahrain who I've spoken to in the past. One boy, um, these are all Karen Biavne boys. One boy who, him, for him, um, cleanliness, hygiene, was something that was his world. It was his world. If he would sit down at the table, in Karen Biavna, I remember this well, if he would sit down and there was like a pile of books, something like, one second, something like this. And you can see that there, very good. If, he, if there would be a pile of books on the table, right, he, he could not learn them. He, could, he just couldn't sit and learn. He would first move everything, put everything in its place. Sometimes he would even go so far as to like wipe the table down. He, he just couldn't do that. Now, that wasn't something he chose. It's not something he, he thought through and he believed in. And that's just who he is. That's his red line. So he cannot marry someone who's not like that. Because for him, it's his essence. It's who he is. I don't know if he chose it or didn't choose it, but that's just who he is. I want to say a very personal one of myself. My red line that for me was I could not handle is someone who's sarcastic or cynical. Someone who uses, uh, yeah, leave it there. But that type of speech goes against my very grain. It just goes against the essence of who I am. It's not to say I can't respect someone from afar. If they're like that, I'll, I would try and understand them and their background and their family, where they come from, from afar. But I don't think I could bring that into my home. I even remember as a bachel having a vision of wanting to make a nameplate that instead of saying family Davidson, it would say 
please leave the cynicism at the door. <laughs> like, you could not bring that into my home. That was my red line. Now, it's very funny because a few years back, I was talking to a boy who Baruch Hashem is happily married now. And he said to me, you know what I need, Rebbe? You know what's like a bottom line for me? I can't handle a girl who's sweet and nice. Like, I need someone who I can, like, he's very, he's very good. He would never be critical in a real way. He's like very sweet and it's all in joking. And everyone who hears him joke knows that. It's like, not even a half a minute that he's being cruel, not at all. But I need someone who I can poke fun at and I can like make fun together and she can make fun of me and they will be sarcastic a little bit. They're like, I just need that. I can't handle someone who's like Tmimus and sweet. I just can't, I was thinking, wow, like I, I hear that. And that is the polar opposite of myself. And you have to respect that. There are some things which for you are your essence. They're who you are. They're the basic nature and makeup of yourself. And those are your personal red lines which you have to figure out. But now he's in a broch, this Yitzchak, because after realizing that, they've gone out on already four dates and he has to let her down. How's he going to do that? So this is the problem. You have to be sensitive and you have to be nice and friendly, but you, you, know, you don't want to lead her on and on and you have to say no at some point. So it's always better to go through a shad chanit. It's always better to have a go-between. And this is always valuable. Even if you met through friends, it is always better to have a go-between the first three or so times you were laid back. Now, I want to tell you a personal story of a shirach that was saved because of this. I have a very close friend who met through a shidduch dating online program, but there was no shadchan there. So they asked me to be the go-between. And I was happy to be. Now, there was a, a, a date that they had, the second or third date, which he phoned me and he said, 99.9% .9 it's not going to happen. And I said, okay, well, tell me, tell me about it. Like, you didn't say 100%. So tell me, like, what was the issue? And he started saying this and this and this and this and this. I said, okay, I got it. Give me a minute. Let me, like, figure it out. I phoned her and I said, how did it go? It was great. Like, I loved it, but I'm not sure he was happy. So I said, uh, interesting, I spoke to him and he said, it could work out. Now, I didn't say he said 99.9% .9 because you need the go-between, right? So I said, it could work out. What's it could work out? 0.001%, I said that, but it could work out. And, uh, but something that bothered him was, and then I expressed a certain point and she said, yeah, well, you know, the night before this and this happened and I, like something big in my family or my work, I don't remember the details. And like, I was totally distracted. My mind was so involved in that. And like, I came to the date. I was thinking even of canceling the date because I wasn't sure I was in my healthy emotional state. I said, you know, I don't want to let this pass. So I went on a date, but like, I know I wasn't myself because I was like so caught up in this. And I said, well, did you share that with him? And she said, no, I didn't want to like start saying all those things. I said, well, okay, let me share with him. So I went back and I phoned him back and I said to him, look, she, she, she hears that. That's just not who she is. She had a bit of a rough day. You said 99.99. There was no point, not no one. Give it another try. And Baruch Hashem, they got married. They have children. They're living in Ramah Beit Shemesh. The dream, the dream. Baruch Hashem. So it's very healthy to have a go-between because things which to you could be taken way out of proportion, having someone as a go-between could just like even it out. Check out with him. Check out with her. What do you mean? What do you mean? But it's only good for the first. And also, and also if after two, three times, you realize it's not meant to be, you can, instead of you being inappropriate, you can do it through the go-between and just like they can share it and it's much less painful. But if you've gone past that stage or four, five, six dates and you've already really formed a bond, you're not using the go-between anymore. You start to connect to each other one-to-one. -one. It is very inappropriate to send a text message and say, yeah, I, I, I figured in the end, you're really nice, but it's not for me. Good luck on the next one. Send. That is very inappropriate. She's invested a world of emotion to this. Another person who I once met was already talking, the girl, I was also the go-between, and the girl was envisioning her wedding dress and she was already planning the hall. And he was saying to me, like, every time I try and like break it to her, then she starts talking about the next stage, the next stage, and there's like no entry for me. And she's taking it forward and taking it forward. I don't want to do. So I was the go-between and I let it down nicely. And you can use a go-between. Fine. So what's an appropriate way? Not to do it on text message, but face to face. Me one more time. You could, you could definitely allude to the fact that you're not sure how it's going so that she's already aware, like on the phone beforehand. So you're not sure how it's going. You just want to meet again. Now, she already understand, but it's not so harsh. You meet again one last time. You sh share some good trait that you recognized in her. Say that you just don't feel that it's suitable for you. And then it will be a very tremendous chesed to do will be then to think yourself of who you know of your friends is someone who Dafka would be suited for her 
And there are many, many, many shiduchim that have come as a result of the boy went on a shidduch with the girl. It didn't work out, but then one of them recommended to a friend and a shidduch came as a result. So that could be a great chest that you could do to follow on as a result. So Baruch Hashem, he followed that advice. He didn't send her a sex message. He didn't do it through the shatchan because it was already quite advanced. He met her one-to-one and Baruch Hashem, it went well. Oh, okay. He's ready for round number five. But he's giving up hope a little bit, to be honest. He says, you know, I just need a break. It's too much for me, four, and it's all failing. I know I'm learning from each one. I know I'm developing myself each time, but it's getting a little much. So he says he's going to have a break, but his friend says, don't take a break. Go to a Rebbe. Go to someone who's a professional in this area. Get advice. There's a rabbi in Bnei Brak, Rabbi Simcha Cohen, who's known to be an expert on this area. Go take advice from him. Maybe he has good advice for you. And I must be honest with you, Yitzchak was a little shocked about what he had to say. We're going to share now about what Rabbi Simcha Cohen had to say. It's a little bit shocking. Are you ready? My Cohen said the following. You know, this whole Shidduch scene, it's a farce. Oh, yeah? It, the whole thing is irrelevant. It's like, you don't have to worry about it. Because it seems like it's a big deal. In America, they call it a crisis. Crisis, shmises, the whole thing's irrelevant. Because, well, could you elaborate on that, Rabbi? Because, like, I don't know. There are books written on this. There's industries. There's websites. People make lots of money involved in this. People lose sleepless nights on this. What do you mean? So the rabbi says, look, do you think that who you marry is going to be the person, who you propose to is the person you're going to marry? Do you know how different people are when you get married and what deeper sides of them, for the good or not for the good, you see? You know, when you get married, you form a bond and it's not her, it's you and her together forming something way, way, way beyond what you currently see. What you're showing of yourself to her and what she's showing of yourself to you is your best behavior. You're trying to live up to expectations that you think the other one has of you. You're using some society's norms of what's expected. And you're making a good show. Obviously, you're trying to be genuine and real. You're doing your best. But ultimately, you'll only really deeply know who the person is after years of investing in them and forming the bond. And to put it bluntly, it doesn't really matter so much who you marry. Now, don't get me wrong. We had some red lines there. We said certain things that are red lines, which you can't overlook. And we said you have to feel comfortable. You can't marry someone you don't feel comfortable with. If you just don't feel comfortable, you don't feel comfortable. We've discussed that. But beyond that, it really doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. You don't have to look for sparks. You don't have to make sure there's no issues there, major issues that between uh, them and their emotional state or them and you that you just can't look at them, you can't respect them. But beyond that, it really doesn't matter. And he said, really? Really? Why do people go out on so many days till they find the right person? He says, I don't know. They should follow the advice of the Igris Moshe. He says, which Igris Moshe? He says, the Igris Moshe in Yoridea, Chelek Aleph, um, page Kuf Nun Gimel. He says, well, what does it say there? So he opens it up and they read it together. He says the Igris Moshe on this very topic. Lemase, I love the Igris Moshe. Lemaise, Lemaise, ain't ze kadai la sot, ain't lit hakem harbe. Don't make svaras, don't be too clever about the matter. Haisha she mozat chen be as long as she's basically attractive to you. Not nothing amazing, but you're not off put by her look. Over mishpachta, and she comes from a basic family. Again, that I, would, I wouldn't include that one nowadays because, as we said, we quoted Rav Scheinberg, sorry, Rav uh, Steinman who said that you can't necessarily judge by a family in our days because of all the internet and all the influences from other places. But basically, she finds favor in your eyes. The Shmuata Tova, right? And there's a good, people say good things about her and you've met her and you feel comfortable. He shomeret dad, she keeps her locha. Yesh lismoch, that's enough. You can rely on that. Velisauta, get married to her. But tikva, tikva, shehia mezumenet lo mina shamayim. You can hope that she's the one from shamayim. Don't start testing her. It won't even help you. Because any things that you try and test, nothing comes out of it. It says just be pure and honest with Hashem. And that's all you need. Or Rabbi Moshe Feinstein to you. So that's the Igros Moshe. Simon Tzadi, page Kuf Nun Gimel in Yoradea Chelek Aleph. Well, the truth is that although he was shocked by that advice initially, it was actually quite relieving 
because now that he knows that all you basically have to do is do background research, make sure you're not looking for any sparks, go out and just feel comfortable with one another, see that you have the basic same general guidelines, that's enough. You feel comfortable, you can get married. I want to tell just a personal story. There was a boy in Karen, I think I told the story before, but it's worth telling again. There was a boy from Karen Avenue who, uh, a very from boy, a very from boy. He went to Griscola afterwards, very from. And uh, he got engaged to a girl who, until that point, wore pants. Now, that's not a typical uh, Karen Avenue shidduch, a girl who wears pants. And his cousin, who was learning Karen Avenue at the time, uh, came to me quite worried. And he says to me, Svi, at that time I was just Svi, it was a much better time in my life. Svi, he said, he said, you won't believe what this cousin of mine who I knew from a few years before in Karen Avenue has done. He's just got engaged to a girl who wears pants. Speak to him, something. Anyway, he came to visit when he was engaged. And afterwards he was in Gruskolo, he came to visit more. And I, I wasn't sure I had to bring it up, but I wasn't going to interfere with his life. But I just said to him, tell me about uh, how did you choose to marry each other? He said to me, well, I'll be honest with you. Um, when it was first suggested, our families knew each other. So when we were much younger, we like very young, like five, six, we used to play together. And I hadn't really spoken to her in the last years, like since I became for mitzvah age, really, I hadn't really spoken to her. But I just always remember that she was like basically good, like good natured, a good person. I, I knew her basic essence of character. And I knew that she wore pants, but I did, that just didn't resound with who she was. She was like a growth oriented individual, someone who wanted to grow. And I was sure that it was just a result of where she was in life and who she was hanging out with. But I was sure, and we discussed this, that once we got married and we take on Torah values, she's someone who we could grow together and we would take on values together. Now, believe me, she didn't wear pants in Gruz Kollel. She moved beyond it by that stage. And today he's a rabbi and a businessman. Uh, he, he has both roles. And he, he's a community leader. One second, quickly plugging in. He's a community leader. He's someone who people look up to. And his wife doesn't wear pants this day. One minute, plugging in. Based on that story, I want to give a very, very important guideline. It doesn't really matter the exact religious level that she's at now or hashkafas that she has now, because it's likely that she picked up those hashkafas from whatever last stage in life she was in, and they made sense to her. It could be that she picked up her hashkafa or her religious level from people she's around or family members. That could be. It doesn't necessarily define her essence. What's much, much, much more important is her direction. If she's someone who's rigid and stubborn, and this is the way, then even if she's on a higher level than you religiously, it's not a good thing for you. Because then you'll want to grow, but she is happy where she is. If you marry someone who their religious level may be lower than yours, the hashkavas might not be the same as yours exactly. They don't eat mahadran, they only eat regular rabbanut. Right? There's something out there which you're not sure of exactly. When you speak it through with them, you see it's not something which is their essence. It's something which is that that's what they know and what they've been taught and where they're from. But you see there's someone growth oriented and you throw out something like, what would you think if like with time we would take on such and such a thing? They, and they answer something on the lines of, I don't know, it's not what I'm familiar with now, but if we would discuss it and it would make sense to us together and we're growing as a couple and we came to a decision mutually, then I'd be fine with it. That's a very healthy answer. That's someone who's a growth oriented individual. You don't want to marry the person where she is now. You want to marry someone who you can see that you're going to grow together. And therefore, a major factor you should be looking for is the fact that there's someone growth oriented, not rigid and stuck in their ways. Baruch Hashem, Yitzchak's ready. He's got that brilliant advice from Rav Simcha Cohen based on the Igris Moshe. He recognizes now this last point. I just want to summarize it very clearly that in order for marriage to be successful, you need two things. You need Ratzon and Avodah. You need to have a will to want it to work and you have to be willing to work. Two things, will that it should work and want and willing to work. Those are the two things. And like my mother-in-law famously said, I love this quote, my mother-in-law's quote, it's not about making the right choice. 
It's about making the choice right. Oh, how true is that statement? If you're waiting for the right choice, oh, this is it, the one, then you may be waiting a long time. Because in the same way that you're not perfect, it's likely you won't find someone else out there who's perfect either. But if you want to make not the right choice, but you're making the choice right, and you do your ishtadlis like the Idagogos Moshe said, you make sure that she's a growth-oriented individual, you look at her, she looks basic fine, you're not off-put by her appearance, and basically on the same ashkafa, you feel comfortable having discussions with her, you feel she's growth-oriented, that's all you need. From there on, it's work. You make it work, you invest, you see someone you're investing together. Baruch Hashem, Yitzchak is in the most healthy mindset he's ever been for Shiduchim. Let's take it a step forward. He, he decides, he's been out four times already. Each time he learns a new lesson. He doesn't want to have to go out another 10 times and each time learn a new lesson. So he says, I'm going to start listening to Shiurim on Shiduchim and get all those lessons in ahead of time. Now, between me and you, I personally, Tzvi David, and have not listened to these Shiurim. But I've heard from people who have listened to them that they were very beneficial for them. So I want to make two recommendations. And these are secondhand recommendations. Number one, there is a website called TorahDownloads.com. There is a Talmud of Rav Shlomo Volbi, whose name is Rav Reuven Leuchter. And he has a series of Shirim on Shiduchim. I haven't listened to them. But boys I've spoken to who have listened to them found them very beneficial with one clause that he's speaking to a little more of a yeshivish community. And therefore, take everything he's saying well, but just check if there's anything which is community orientated, it might be location based, then just check if that also applies to who you are and where you are, just to ensure that's also relevant for you. Rabbi Reuven Leuchter, TorahDownloads.com. That's number one. That's a little more on the yeshiva side. Now, second one, which I want to recommend, and this is coming not from a rabbi, but from a psychologist, uh, or a, a somewhat professional in this area, there's another website called TorahAnytime.com. And on that website, there is a Dr. Jack Cohen. And he has numerous short shiurim, all quite short, four minutes, seven minutes, where he brings out short ideas of, 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 of hashkaf of shiduchim and human interaction. And those, I listened to one today, just before, so before I recommend it, I'll be able to uh, just say that it's worth listening to. I was very impressed. It was very clear, to the point, practical advice. Dr. Jack Cohen. On that same website, someone else I want to recommend on dating and on rela human relationships in general is um, Dr. David Lieberman. He has a very broad series on many, many things, but he also has on Shiduchim, he calls it dating, and on Shalom Bayis, also highly recommends. That's for further research for everyone to listen to. So our friend Yitzchak, he does this. He starts listening to Shiurim. He starts reading books. He doesn't have to go through many different issues. And these are a couple of suggestions that he comes up with. Everyone with pen and paper, get it out now. These are guidelines on how to make Shiduchim successful. Okay, number one. The Shiduchim, on a technical level, should be roughly one to two a week with phone calls in between. And each shidduch shouldn't be too long. I just understand the idea behind this. If you meet every day in a short period of time, you don't have time for your emotions to uh, process. It's just too quick and you get carried away. If you make it more than once a week, then because you're not continuing the process, then doubts start coming in from nowhere just because you haven't progressed enough at a, at a good pace. Meeting once a week or twice a week or maybe even once every two weeks if that's what calls for it, but with phone calls in between, enables you to feel a sense of progression. But with enough time that you can process everything that's going on. That's point number one. Point number two, and this is very important. There is no logic in meeting in a hotel lobby. It is the worst place to have a shidduch. It's boring. There is nothing going on around you. And you just sit there awkwardly and everything has to be based on your talking. But where are you going to talk from? You don't have any background and life experience together. So this is what happens in a hotel lobby. So uh, what's your favorite color? Uh, blue. Oh, great. Mine's red. Should we order a drink? Yeah, that's a good idea. Order. Okay, they're coming. When are they coming? They're coming soon. When are they coming? They're coming now. So uh, which... 
uh, high school, did you, it's very awkward. It's not comfortable. In order to do shiduchim in a real way and an effective way, it has to be real life scenarios. I'm not saying that you shouldn't sit in a hotel lobby after a few dates, or maybe that's the only option of where you can go that you can do on the first day, but realize that you're being held back. But the best way is to walk outside. Manhattan in the winter is not a good idea, but maybe move to Florida. I don't know. Walk outside is so healthy. There are, you, you don't have to look at each other, which is a halachic isr anyway, to gaze at each other, for, ple- for her, you to gaze at her for pleasure. You can look at her once when you say, Shalom Aleichem, my name's Tzvi, and then you can just walk together side by side. And there's lots of interesting things going on. There are things happening all the time. The first time I ever met my wife was in the corner of Kikar Shabbat in Meir Sharin. And then we started walking towards the old city. And I happen to have had numerous humorous experiences on my Friday trips to Meir Sharim. So it was great. I was able to say, oh, this is Manny. Let me tell you a story that once happened to me, Manny. And then started a story and then it was great. I, I didn't have anything to say initially, but then just the situation brought them out. You're walking together, you see something, something happens, it triggers something. It's very natural. That's the most natural way to have a shidduch. As time progresses, you could do activities together. Obviously, don't go too expensive on the first time. You don't have to take her out to some fancy restaurant on the first date every time. But walking is free. You can just walk outside and have a healthy conversation. Uh, you can go do activities together. Uh, my second or third shidduch, I went to the Shuk Machana Yehuda to buy uh, sweets and candy for Mishloach Manos. And we just, I had to do that anyway. I said, do you want to join me? Very good. We're in the shop together. She gets to see how my bartering skills with the different merchants work. It's a very healthy, real-life experience. Uh, you could go to a, rest, uh, to a supermarket together and each pick out different food and then have a picnic. That's a great experience. You could then see what you like, what does she like, how do you shop together. At some point, if you've developed it a little further, you can go for a Shabbos meal together to a family, which is very real. You can see each other and the dynamic of other people. But make sure do some real life scenarios, real life pictures that you can get to see them in a very authentic and genuine way. That was point number two. Point number three, and I cannot underemphasize this point. And again, it connects to who I am as my nature, but this is a potential Mekach Taos happening over here. So you have to be, be real and authentic and genuine. There's this false idea that you want to show your best self and you want to make yourself out to be who she wants you to be. And then some later point down the line, then you suddenly reveal that actually I have this problem and that problem. I'm not saying you have to bring out all your issues from the beginning. But you have to be very real with who you are. You may imagine yourself to be going to be the next God of Or you may imagine yourself to have a dream home of being uh, learning hours a day. And you may imagine yourself as having no emotional issues or no issues in the background. But you have to be just very real and open. And she will respect you for sharing them. As long as you share them and you're in an emotionally healthy place. In fact, once you share something which is troubling you and how you're overcoming it and dealing with it, she will also say, well, you know, if you're being open, let me share with you as well. And then you get to meet the real person. Now, I want to add one clause to this point. So point number three was, it doesn't have to be the first date where you like open up with, by the way, I've had this uh, psychological analysis and I went to therapy for this. And No, no, no. You can be calm and easy going at the beginning. I'm only talking about from the third, fourth date onwards. But be real, be authentic, be yourself, be open, share who you are, what you're struggling with, and how you overcome it. She'll see the real authentic you, and she'll share that real authentic with herself. Now, I want to add one clause. And this is something we just come up often. I often get the question, Rebbe, I have issues with internet usage. Do I have to share that with the girl? It, unfortunately, it's a common question. Now, I'm telling you my perspective. I don't know if everybody agrees with me. This is my view. It depends. If it's something which is still ongoing, even infrequently, but it's something which you you sometimes fall in and it does happen that even now you're still falling, then it is important, not right at the beginning, but at some point to share it. It is important because if chas v'shalom it happens, that it's something which then gets more severe and it's something which then she catches you doing and then she says, I can't believe this is the man that I married and then she'll be distraught and she'll feel um, tricked. However, if it's something which you did in high school, but the last two years, it's been a non-issue for you. I'm not giving exact numbers here, but you can, you can use your intuition with this. But it's something which, something in the past, you've put the appropriate boundaries up. 
Not to say you don't have any temptation, but you're in a healthy place now. You've been in a healthy place for a long period of time. Nine months, two years. I don't know how to give an exact number here, but you feel confident with who you are and time has tested that you're in a healthy place. Then I don't believe that you need to share that. It brings up an issue which is not a relevant issue. The only things you need to bring up are things which are relevant for who you are when you're coming to marry. You don't have to bring up things which are not relevant for who you're marrying. So if you did things in the past, which you're pretty sure of that they're no longer relevant and you did what you did, but you've overcome it and you're in a healthy place today, you don't struggle with it now. Then by bringing it up, it causes a real concern with no basis. But if it's something which even occasionally does affect you now and you do struggle with it on a constant basis now, then it is important, not on the first day, but to share it at some point. And obviously together with that, share with, what precautions you've taken to make sure that you're in a strong place and how you've overcome it. That was point number three, being honest and being um, authentic. Point number five, and this is a little bit amusing, uh, but this is going to be very good advice for you, not only on Shaduchim, but also long-term Shalom bias. Women love talking. You don't have to talk so much. You primarily have to listen. Now, it's pretty, this is a pretty amazing thing, and take this to heart. If you are married to a woman or you're on a shidduch with a woman and you listen very well and don't even say very much, but you just like reflect back on what you've heard. You ask follow on questions from what you've heard. You show a little empathy. Wow, that must have been rough. Then you don't have to say anything at all, really. She's usually not looking for advice. She just wants to share what's in her inner world. And all she's really, really looking for is that you hear her, you understand her. It's really easy. You don't have to come with great solutions. Don't make that mistake of men, of a woman is sharing with me, she wants the solution, and I'm going to be the hero to save her and say the perfect solution. If you give the solution, she'll say, you don't get me. You just don't get me. Why are you always going to for a solution? So hear this point very well. On Shiduchim and for life, primarily what a woman wants, unless she asks for advice, then give advice. But unless she asks for advice, primarily she just wants to be heard. And the way that you listen is by genuinely, authentically listen without the phone nearby, hearing everything she says, reflecting back by saying in your own words what you heard her say, and then giving empathy by relate, giving the emotion a name. Just call it a name. Say, wow, that was filled with anxiety. Yes, wow, that was a really rough time to go through. Yes, wow, you seem like overjoyed. You feel so satisfied with what you've done. Yes, you get me. And what did you do? You just related back what she said and you gave it an emotional label. That's all you need to do. That's all she needs. So on Shiduchim, you can hand over the microphone to her primarily. Now, if she's awkward at the beginning, it may take time. Then you be open and you share. And by you sharing something personal, then she will then go and share personal things too. But once she gets that microphone, it's likely that it will be hard to get it back from her. So primarily listen, give empathy, relate back. That was point number five. Point number six, um, we mentioned this in an illusion, but it's worthwhile repeating. It's very unhealthy to come into a shidduch with a preconceived idea of the perfect woman. Just imagine what happens. You go on a date and you're comparing her to everyone you've met in the past. Well, she's good, but she's not as good in the sense of humor of that one. She's good, but she's not as good as how attractive that one. She's good, but she doesn't have the yichos of that third one that I met. She's good. At, and you build this imaginary perfect woman who no one could ever live up to, and they don't exist. And therefore, come in each time on a fresh page. Like we defined earlier, all you're coming in with is a mindset of, I just want to see if I can have a good time, just see if it's natural, see if we can enjoy each other's company. She's basically a growth-oriented individual. We're basically on the same page. That's all I'm looking for. I've done all the other background checks. I'm, I'm comfortable with that already. That's all you're looking for. Don't come and start comparing and judging and making lists in your mind. That will be unhealthy. Okay. Yitzchak is pumped. He's confident. He's going on his fifth date. And Baruch Hashem, it's good. They're appropriate. They have complementary personalities. They're also different in their personalities, but he's okay with it this time. He feels comfortable with it. He feels like a good blend. Um, she has a desire to grow. She's a growth-oriented person. She's good-looking enough for him. He finds her company pleasant. He admires her character. They have similar life goals. It's not off put by her. And he feels basically ready. And as that phrase comes to his mind, he feels this big gulp of, mm, ready? To, 
to, to, to, to, to get married. But, but I, I don't know. I don't know. And, and he feels very unsure of himself. And she says to him, you know, like, I feel it's going well. What do you feel? Which is more his role to say than her role, but he is too uncomfortable to say it. So he says, yeah, it could be going well. Now that could be going well. There's a dagger in her heart. Could be going, what do you, what do you, could be going? no, 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 it's fine. I, I don't have anything wrong. I'm just, uh, I just, I, I feel I need more time. Okay, well, let me know when you're ready. Uh, okay. And he doesn't know what to do. There's no more issues. It was easier when there were issues because then he could say, oh, this issue, that issue. Now there's no issues. So he doesn't know what to do. So this is it. I mean, meaning, meaning this is the one I'm going to, meaning for the rest of my life, this is the one I'm going to marry. It's a little hard to make that decision. So his friends are fed up with him a little bit by now because he's always uh, sharing all the different issues that he has. And they say, okay, man, you need a psychologist. Dr. Mayor Wickler. You have to go to see Dr. Mayor Wickler. Have you ever heard of Dr. Mayor Wickler? He is the man for this type of a thing. So he goes to see Dr. Mayor Wickler, also recommended. I don't know if he has uh, Shirim on Shaduch. He probably does. Worth looking up again. I'm sure he has Shirim online. He goes to Dr. Mayor Wickler. And Dr. Mayor Wickler says to him, let me ask you one simple question. Tell me, when you were choosing a yeshiva, so, like, it was an easy choice for you? Are you kidding me? Do you know what a difficult decision was to make a yeshiva? Like, what I did was, like, I, I spoke to someone who went to every single yeshiva, and every time I spoke to him, I'm like, I'm convinced, that's where I'm going. And then I spoke to the next guy, that's where I'm going. And then I, I, I said, okay, I'm going to write it all down, and I had, like, seven different yeshivas all there, and like, I, 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 I was going to just flip a coin. I, I didn't know what to do. So what did he do in the end? So I tell the truth that even I was on the plane, on the same flight as me, there was boys going to Shalavim, there were boys going to Tobo, and there were boys carrying up in it. And I got off the plane, I said, okay, which one should I go? Like, should I follow that one? That one? I wasn't sure until the last minute. And then, and then what happened? Because well, when I got to Karen Biafin in the end, then like, I, I wasn't sure, but then like, I started, I started like, I had and I started Shir. I was debating it even for a while at the beginning, but then, but then like, it just, it just like kind of solved itself. And like, I'm not sure to this day if I chose the right one, but, but, but Lemaise, looking back, it was a very good place. Actually, no, I can say it now. I can say it now. It was actually the best place for me. It was the best place. So America's smiling away. So, so you feel it's not an issue with this girl per se. You feel like it's a general thing you have difficulty making decisions. He goes, are you kidding me? Like, I don't even know which pair of socks to wear in the morning. Like, it used to be that everyone had black socks. Now, all these colorful socks and designs. Like, I sit there for like a good three minutes saying, I wore that one two days ago. I wore that one four days ago. Like, I think I'm going to go for this one. So Mayor May Wickler says to him, look, Dr. Mayor Wickler says to him, look, let me, let me give you a simple guideline. If you have a real issue, if there's some real defined issue that you have, it's important to clarify. It's important. Maybe that's an issue where there's a lot more behind it that you haven't got into yet. It's important to clarify. But let me ask you, do you feel now that you've got to a place where you basically know her. I mean, obviously there's going to be new things that come up. Maybe when she was in kindergarten, she was suspended for uh, not drinking milk. And all. I don't know. Maybe you'll find something that will come up with time. But do you basically feel that like whichever topic would come up now, you have a general idea of like where she's going to take it and who she is. And like, do you feel there's going to be more big surprises about her personality that it can still come out? Or do you feel you have a basically good sense of who she is? He says, well, I can't say I know her 100%. Yeah, okay, no, no, I'm not talking about 100%, but like basically you have an idea. He says, yes. Yeah, yeah. He says, and, and you have a hard time with decisions in general. Yes, yeah, always, everything. So Rav Meir Wickler said, it's going to be the same as Yeshiva. It could be, and I'm going to be honest with you now, it could be that even after you're married, could be throughout Shana Rishona, someone who has difficulty making decisions will even debate, was it the right choice, wasn't it the right choice? You don't have to worry. Take the same model as the Karen Biavna model for you. If it's something which you're sure there are no issues there, you've clarified them. No, but maybe there's an issue that I don't know about. No, 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 no. Let's just be on the ground here. A real something that came to you. If there was a real issue, it would have come to you by now. If there's nothing that you can pinpoint that's a real issue and you feel comfortable and you enjoy each other's company and you have a hard time making decisions, it may plague you for a while. But in the same way as Karen Biavna, when you look back, you said it was the right decision it was the right decision, then you can be pretty rest assured that you can go ahead with it. And the more you invest, the more secure you'll be, the more comfortable you'll be, and you'll be able to take that next step forward. Mazel tov. So Yitzchak, here's the advice. And he says, you know, you know, I, I hear it. it makes sense. 
It makes sense. It's, it's something which is general. I, I feel that in every way. So Yitzchak, he says, okay, this is it. He goes to her and he says, you know, I've been thinking and um, Baruch Hashem, I really feel comfortable together. And she says, it's nice to hear. I wish I would have heard that a few days. I mean, yeah, it's nice to hear. Yes, yes, Yitzchak. Because I was thinking that I was thinking that if you want to take that next step forward, then, um, then I don't have any issues with that. You don't have any issues with that. She's, yes. I mean, like, so she says, Yitzchak, are you proposing? So he says, uh, I'm trying. She says, look, I'm very excited that I'm ready to get married, but this isn't exactly how I envisioned my husband proposing. So could we do it a little differently? So she says, he says, okay. He says, could we, could you tell me, like, so we're going to meet a certain time and then we'll meet there and like, let me know that we're going to get engaged. And then I can like, let all my friends know this is what's going to be happening. And then I like, tell them, don't call until I call you. And then, and then just like, just say it, but like confidently and happily. Could you do that? So he says, uh, I, I could do that. I, I, I could do that. Sure, I could do that. And Yitzchak just learned a very, very important lesson from his future color. He learned the lesson that sometimes it's very healthy to be open emotionally and, and share what you need. Just share, like, you know, like, I was expecting certain things. They didn't come exactly, but no one here is mean or cruel. And I wouldn't even call it insensitive. It's just that you haven't developed that yet. And Yitzchak learned that important life lesson that whenever he also feels something, don't hold it in. Just like be straightforward and be honest. It's like, say, this is what I need from you now. And when you are two people who want to grow together and want to share with each other how you want to grow, then it's, it's fine. Don't make up as if you need to know and predict what the other person is thinking. You can just be open emotionally and you can share that. And that could be a much healthier way of viewing it. So Baruch Hashem, the Shidduch is going through. They tell their parents there's going to be a vort. The parents are over the moon. All the friends are ready. Finally, Yitzchak's getting married. I mean, in our story, it was only six times or five times. But in real life, someone could have many, many times till they figured all this out. But anyone who's heard these guidelines from people like Dr. Jack Cohen, people like Dr. Mayor Wickler, people like Rav Simcha Cohen, people like Rav um, Ruben Leuchter, people like Rav, uh, Rav Volby, people, uh, all these people we're drawing on, they could go into the Shidduch with a very healthy hashkafa. And potential mistakes that other people make, they can pass by and not have to make them themselves. Oh my gosh, we haven't done Dor Yisharim. We haven't done Dor What in the world is Dor Yisharim? Dor Yisharim is where you go to a medical lab and you have yourself tested and you check that there's no Tay-Sachs issues. And what do we do now? We're ready to get engaged. We haven't done Dor Yisharim. So how long does Dor Yisharim take? It takes three weeks. Three weeks? Are you kidding? I'm ready to get engaged tomorrow. Well, if you pay a lot of money, they do an emergency one where they give you results in two days. Okay, well, please, why did no one tell me about this? Do Doria Sharim way before you meet. You don't have to wait. You have your results already before you meet. And then when the Shidduch is suggested, you just phone up that would have saved and pay a lot of extra money to get emergency results of Doi Yashorim. Okay, I'll remember for next time. No, what next time? No, next time. I will remember to tell my friends that they should do Doi Yashorim way out of time. Okay, Baruch Hashem. Sisu v'simchu v'sha'a toiva kol sason v'kol simcha The Davidson family are very happy to host Sheva Brochus if Yitzchok and Rina, let's call her, would like to host their Shavrochus in Karen Biavane, then Baruch Hashem, we have more space in our home now. My wife loves making Shavrochus. We've made for numerous Talmudim who had this like nostalgic sense of having a Shavrochus back in Karen Biavane where they learned. So there's an open invitation there for everyone who's listening right now or anyone you want to share this on with. The Davidson family love hosting Shavrochus. So Yitzchok and Rina take up the offer and they get married by the in the old city overlooking the Kotel, Chuppah, and the roof of Eish Torah, with Tzvila for the base of English to be rebuilt. They later on have the hall and some outdoor corona, up to 20 people on this balcony, 20 people on that balcony, 30 people on that balcony, and like this kind of multi-layered wedding they have. And then a couple of days later, they come to Kerem Avne and uh, all wearing masks, of course. The Davidson household have a Shiva Brochus, 
and my kids make all these little games and riddles. My wife makes this delicious menu and I share a word of Torah, happy and satisfied that the guidelines that I've learned from my Rebbeim enabled another great Shidduch to take place. Sha'atova over Mazalto. Thank you for listening.